Good morning, friends. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship at Stony Brook. My name is Maureen Shaman, and I am happy to be your worship associate this morning, along with Reverend Margie Allen, our minister. Our director of religious education is Deb Little. For information about our in-person religious education class schedule and how to contact Deb, please see our website at uufsb.org. A special welcome to any of you who are here with us for the first or second time today. I hope that you find among us inspiration for living and nourishment for your spirit. We are glad to have you here with us, and since our services vary each week, we hope that you will return several times to really get to know us as a community of faith. Unitarian Universalism as a living tradition is committed to freedom of belief and oriented toward inclusion, interdependence, and justice. You can find additional information about the principles we strive to live by on our website. We are a congregation of seekers who have come from a variety of faith traditions, and we welcome those of all ages, abilities, and identities who are searching for a spiritual home. If you are attending the service virtually, please watch the chat for the order of service and a few important links during the service, especially the visitors form and the feedback form. We would love to hear from you. After the service, you can leave this virtual space, go to our webpage, and click the link for small group chats in order to visit with a smaller group of friendly people. I have three brief announcements to share with you this morning. First of all, summer is coming. Have faith. It's your chance to lead a service. A treasured tradition here at UUFSB is that we get to know one another much better over the summer when we ourselves, the members and friends, give a variety of services on a single theme. This year, the topic is an adult book that changed my life. Now, I know it, not everyone is a book person, although as a longtime English teacher, it pains me to say that. But if ever a book about anything at all caught your imagination, made you think, changed the way you thought about something important, made you sigh or laugh or grow up a bit, please share it with us and share a bit of yourself. You will have lots of help from an experienced worship associate who will help you craft your ideas into reflections and a whole service. The deadline has been extended to April 20th, so please see the announcement in the newsfeed or on our website and send your proposal to Susan in the office. If you need a sounding board first, Mike Hoffman and I and all the worship associates are here for you. Call, email, send smoke signals, and we'll talk it through with you. Second, the next and perhaps final town hall to discuss the proposed eighth principle will be today at 1215. We'll last about an hour, and we'll be both in the sanctuary and virtually, so um, uh, please attend either one. It will start, um, uh, <laughs> our congregational vote on this incredibly important item will be at our annual meeting on the first Sunday in June. So everyone really needs to understand how fundamentally important uh, this is to the future of Unitarian Universalism in the United States. So come and hear a new group of cheerful enthusiasts, including some of our wonderful youth, uh, present and discuss their reasons for supporting this principle. Come, bring your open-hearted questions, and be inspired. And third, this month's evening labyrinth walk on this beautiful labyrinth you see here on our floor will be this Tuesday at 8 p.m. Charles Holdener will be playing a Native American flute for us. And weekly walks have also started again. Every Thursday at 2 p.m. we gather to walk indoors. For both events, you must reserve with Linda Michael, whose contact information is on the bulletin board in the hall. These events are free. <coughs> Let us enter together now into the sacred space of worship with the sounding of the morning bell. I have asked 
Jeff Kochnauer to light our chalice while I read the chalice lighting by Jennifer McLaughlin, like the first hint of green. As the first hint of green begins to peek through the barren ground, as that little sprig grows into a healthy stem, as that stem grows into a stalk and forms a bud, as that bud slowly opens with each new day to form a yellow daffodil, let us be like that first hint of green, renewed by the warm of the sun's rays and ready to emerge with a new energy, ready to face the day. We light this chalice to bring a glimmer of that warmth into our space. Thank you, Jeff. We are currently in the midst of our annual pledge drive, which funds our existence for the entire year. Every year, we ask several people to tell us what the fellowship means to them and how they decide to pledge. I invite Chris Philstrup at this time to come and offer us a UU Pledge Drive Minute. Good morning. It's nice to be back in the building. Uh, Lori and I have been members of this uh, congregation for eight years. And we've benefited uh, in many, many, many ways from having this as our spiritual home in sort of two big categories. One is to be in a, in a community of shared values, and that's sort of a comfort area for us at least once a week. But the other is also a place which uh, challenges us to do more in the world, to take these values and apply them to our daily lives. And that's kind of pushing us out of our comfort zone to try things uh, that we haven't tried before. We pledge biblically. We tithe. That is, we give one-tenth of our net income to this fellowship. The primary motivation for that is that Lori and I have benefited enormously from just being alive. Uh, we did not staff the schools, which gave us a really great education. We didn't build our house. We don't grow our food. Uh, we're deeply, deeply beneficiaries of what other people, both past and present, have done. So we have an obligation to repay. That's, our, that's a responsibility we have from everything that we have received to give, to give back. And we don't just give it to any organization. We want it to come in, a, in our spiritual home, a place that we consider sacred. And it brings to mind the idea of sacrifice. Um, sacrifice is a, a strong element in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, you know, right away comes to my mind Abraham, God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac uh, in a COVID uh, context, we, we might say Abigail sacrificed a year of income in order to stay home with her children. So sacrifice has a sense of loss, uh, even pain, but that's what actually makes it sacred. You can, see, you can see the word sacred in sacrifice. So this is our place to repay in some sacred way. Uh, we have benefited and we want to pay back, pay back and in this wonderful congregation is the place where we do it. Thank you.
On the Christian calendar today is Palm Sunday, the day we remember the journey of the Jewish prophet Jesus to and through the streets of Jerusalem, the final week of his ministry and his life. He rode on the back of a young donkey, it is said, and was welcomed by crowds waving palm fronds. Hosanna, the crowd cried a word which derives from the Hebrew hosiana, meaning save us, we pray. And this Friday evening begins the spring festival of Passover, seven or eight days of ritual and holiday joy, recalling and celebrating the exodus of the Hebrew people led by the prophet Moses from a long and brutal period of enslavement in Egypt. Without the prophet's leadership, his people would surely have perished at the hands of the Egyptian army on the shores of the Red Sea. Next week, we'll turn to the courage displayed by these ancient prophets as they led their followers toward a vision held purely on faith and not always securely, a vision of peace, community, and abundant life. But today, we're going to go where many religious faiths fear a little bit to tread. Earth Day falls also in this brief period of time, and we consider the possibility this morning of a very practical kind of salvation in which all of us earthlings together cast a vision of a delicious, beautiful, sustainable life on Earth and work methodically and cur courageously to drag that reality towards us out of the increasingly grim array of future possibilities. We do this together, all of us leaders in faith, all of us move to heroic commitment by the love that connects us, inspires us, and is seamlessly woven into everything we create. And we start this Sunday with the love part, because everything moves from that big heart. And we'll start with this long island, because of all the possible places to plant ourselves, we have chosen this particular portion of earth for now or forever. I offer this reminder of our relationship to the land our fellowship occupies, our land acknowledgement. The Congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship at Stony Brook honors the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral land included the acres we claim as ours today. We recognize the Satalkit people from whom this territory was stolen incrementally through grossly, grossly inequitable, opaque, and duplicitous exchanges between 1655 and 1662. 
Their descendants live on today as the Satalkut Nation, among them our neighbors residing in Satalkut's Bethel, Christian Avenue, Laurel Hill Historic District. We acknowledge these ancestors and survivors and realize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. We honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants who carry on tribal traditions for present and future generations. What if, what if each of us decided to love the earth the way we love the person we love most or have loved most in all the world? With that depth of affection, admiration, commitment, and concern, with that longing for proximity, for intimacy, for creative interchange, with that quality of connection, interdependence, and loyalty in which any degree of separation is only endurable if temporary, and always temporary because always courageously and compassionately addressed. What if each of us, with our beloved Earth, were bound as partners in life to evolving bodies, bound to honor the integrity of our relationship with each other, and to support each other's well-being, our Earth's no less than our own, and maybe more, to the best of our ability, all our lives. With elegant reciprocity, with just ferocity in our defense of our relationship and of Earth against all dangers, with acknowledgment that our circles of connection extend well beyond our own partnership and into an inclusive and interconnected network of kinship, and with the understanding that the way we love carries the goodness of the loving beyond us into that magnificent web of all being that is our planet and our universe. What if we looked for dis signs of distress Earth shows in the same way we would observe with concern a person we love beyond words? As we would rush to a parent who has fallen assess the damage, find out what happened, and take steps to prevent future falls. As we would notice the flushed face of a child, identify a fever, consult a doctor, administer the needed medication, and create an environment for healing. As we would pick up on subtle patterns in the behavior of a loved one that portend disequil disequilibrium or disease, and ask questions, and take action proactively as we would rush a beloved companion animal to a vet when we discover an abscess or a swollen joint. What if each of us decided to love the earth the way we love the person we love most or have loved most in all the world? What if we loved her responsibly, passionately, attentively, wisely, humbly, respectfully, gratefully, every day, day in and day out? What if we loved her so much and supported her so fiercely and tended her needs so thoroughly and grew to understand her functioning so intimately that we could turn back the clock on the losses she has suffered and the wounds she sustained and the filth that obscures her beauty and the complex life systems that have been compromised? What if humanity's love could heal the earth? What if healing the earth healed humanity as well?
please join me in the responsive reading in your order of service or on your screen. Beginners by Denise Levertov, dedicated to the memory of Karen Silkwood and Elliot Grala. I will read the regular type and I invite you to join in with the italics. But we have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How can desire fail? We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Surely our river cannot already be hastening into the sea of non-being. Not yet. Not yet. There is too much broken that must be mended. We have only begun to know the power that is in us if we would join our solitudes in the communion of struggle. Denise Levertov, I believe, died in 1977. So come now, let's enjoy a few minutes of quiet time for reflection. Already there's been a lot to take in and more to come. This time I'm going to ask you if you are willing to discover in your memory a natural place on Long Island that you particularly treasure or a place that has to do with the natural world on Long Island. A place you treasure on this rock. Use the time you have in the silence that follows my words to picture this place as vividly as you can and to review for yourself what things about it specifically that you love and why. And Peter and Didi will bring us back out of the silence with hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. If you don't know it by heart, you might want to open the book on your lap so it's ready for you to sing. And I will see you there.
Before I read the first letter from Long Island, I wanted to share uh, what I was reflecting on during the silence. Um, when Nina Rubenstein, 20-year-old girl, died uh, a little over a year ago, coming on two years, coming on two years, um, her family gave away um, milkweed pods and eventually I took the one, two that I had and opened them up in the breeze in our backyard. Uh, and then I forgot all about it. But last fall, I realized that the things that were coming up back in the back of our yard against the fence were um, milkweed plants and on them monarch butterfly caterpillars doing their thing and uh, that's what came to my mind with all the colors of those larvae of those caterpillars um, in my mind so today we're fortunate to hear two letters from long island when did that happen before dear humans I want to begin with this. I've been at this a long time, being a long island, even longer becoming one. Time and dimensions being human inventions, of course. I am part of something much bigger to which I'm still connected and which was at one point part of another yet larger thing that broke into pieces and was flung into space. My knowing is different from yours. It's hard to explain. Long time, very hot, very cold, bedrock, underwater, a thick blanket of sand and clay, a shore and coastal plain, the river-made trough that would become the sound and carve out the harbors of the North Shore. And then, just yesterday, a million of your years ago, the great sheets of ice formed above me and moved across me back and forth like waves the weight of it, the scraping and the raking, freezing and melting, cracking and polishing, the piling up of till and drift before and behind the leading lip of ice as I came into a shape you might have begun to recognize. I was sculpted in time by water and ice and wind. And I have been beautiful. I am beautiful. I am becoming beautiful. The earth I belong to is four and a half billion of your years old. The finely engraved fish-shaped island you walk upon is only about 8,000 years old. I am an infant in geological time. It was only a few thousand years earlier that you, first, your, you humans first came to explore and settle here. I was still changing, and still I change. I am old on your scale of time, and you are just a blink in time in mine. Yet we continue to become together. I am the earth you belong to. We are both, we are all part of something larger that includes us. We are partners in formation and survival. I remember the footsteps of your ancestors when they first walked my long body. 
They walked softly, looked well, watched carefully, loved dearly what they saw. We knew each other. We knew ourselves, kin. Very little changed during that time, except under the whip of wind and water. Our nest of life grew more diverse. Green things burgeoned. The sea and forests and marshes and plains yielded food and materials for shelter. We were rich together, strong, interesting, known to one another. We tended each other in our changes. We became as close to one thing as I had ever experienced. We became together for each other, not despite each other. It is that closeness, that shared knowing, that wealth of possibility lying open between us, that sense of purpose and oneness I seek again. I have come to know in my way that I cannot be your land if you cannot be my people. And I have never before ever felt so out of touch with humankind. I grieve the loss and the less. I will write again. It is our spiritual practice to share our offering plate with a deserving social justice recipient. All bills and coins will be shared 50-50 between UUFSB and the social justice recipient unless you instruct us differently. And if you write a check, you may instruct on the memo line how much is to go to social justice and how much to your pledge. This week's recipient is the Brookhaven Landfill Action and Remediation Group. BLARG is a grassroots organization formed by people living in Medford, Bellport, and North Bellport, close to the Brookhaven Landfill. When a proposal was made in Brookhaven Town to keep the landfill open past its scheduled closure date in 2005, individuals who were already active about the landfill formed this group. Besides the constant stench, living near the landfill has been shown to increase cancer rates, increase maternity deaths, and increase infant mortality enough to decrease life expectancy by several years. The rate of asthma and other respiratory illnesses is much higher there than in surrounding communities. Blarg is working to get this landfill closed to not allow a new landfill to be opened right next to it and is researching and proposing alternatives that are not just in someone else's backyard. Those of you who attended the service on March 27th were privileged to meet two of its founding members. Blarg is not a 501c3 organization, but your donations to share the plate are income tax deductible as usual and will be gratefully received.
So lovely, thank you. Dear humans, it's not that time is speeding up in your world. You still have the same minutes and hours and days. It's that critical changes are happening that have a devastating impact on the delicate mechanisms that interact to create equilibrium in our shared life. These changes are happening more often and unfolding more quickly. The rate of change is accelerating, accelerating in the wrong direction and is frighteningly resistant to correction. I grieve for what is lost, for what will be lost. I grieve for you and for the vision of those first peoples, the vision of your sages and prophets, your vision of Eden, of life abundant, of enough for all, of milk and honey, of peace among nations. I grieve and I am angry. I'm angry. You are suffering from a pandemic. Thousands upon thousands of people have died. Earth is suffering from a pangeanic crisis. I guess I would call it that, I made it up. I think the closest equivalent for a human being might be a blood fever. Your doctors call it sepsis, an infection that travels to every organ through the circulation of the blood. In your bodies, it kills by destroying body systems one at a time. A human can survive the loss or impairment of one system, but maybe not two, and definitely not three. Without treatment, death is certain and swift. With treatment, residual effects are likely, and death is still possible. How can you not see not feel, not hear, not simply intuit that your earth is sick to death and suffering. How can you not care if not for the wonder that earth just is all the time, then for the fact that your fate is tied to hers and has been from the beginning if her lungs fail, if carbon dioxide fails to circulate and accumulates instead, your lungs will fail too. If her kidneys fail, if she's unable to filter poisons out of the air and water, then your kidneys and liver will fail too. If her gut fails, if she's unable to maintain the right balance of nutrients in the soil and water and air, then your gut will fail too. Every reduction in the vast gene pool she sustains creates new pathways for disease and impairment and fewer pathways for healing and innovation. I could go on. Bottom line, my dear humans, is that the survival of your bodies depends on the survival of her body. You are inseparable from her, and so is every other living thing she bears through space. I do not understand why your big brains cannot grasp this divinely simple idea. Everything you need to know about how to live well over your generations is written in the scripture called Earth. Read. Read it. 
balance, prudent give and take, stewardship, moderation, cleanliness, simplicity, attention, sacrifice, diversity, humility, respect. I could go on. For your God's sake, read it. Read it, study it, know it like the back of your hand, live it. It's really the only religion that matters. I am rock and sand and wind and waves and aquifers and erratic stones and barrier islands and lagoons and salt marshes and pine barrens and ancient plains, kettles and rivers and all the life they nurture, including you. I am so honored to carry you to protect you, to feed you, to entertain you, to provide materials for your well-being and your prodigious creativity. I am with you and of you every second of every day. And still these days, you feel distant and cold. And I miss you. I long for your gaze, your care, your touch on sand and branch, flower, fur and feather, your attention, your understanding, your inclusion of my priorities in all of your decisions and doings on the land. Please, please, please turn your faces towards me and see and do, there is still time to love me back, to love us all back together into life. I will write again one day. Yours always this long island. And here ends the letter. I wish we could have heard it in Long Island's actual voice. I invite you to respond by standing wherever you are and singing together hymn number 163, For the Earth Forever Turning, a hymn of praise and love and joy.
closing words are a litany of praise originally composed by me for an intergenerational Thanksgiving service way back in 2012. It's called Loving Long Island. I think that we heard it in some form in 2019, but I'm not sure. The, it's an interactive poem, and I encourage you to temper your inhibitions. The word island is repeated as a trigger to which you can respond by shouting out a word or a gesture or an affirmation or just woohoo. Um, today I suggest the phrase love her or love you. So every time you hear the word island, go ahead and shout out the words love her or love you plus any kind of hooting and hollering you'd like to do in addition. I read it fast. Our Long Island home is shaped like a fish, and it is swimming towards the big city, and its tail is in the sea and the sound. It's 110 miles long and 20 miles wide, 700 miles and 124 stations on the Long Island radio railroad, 72 miles of Long Island Expressway, hundreds of sights and sounds and colors long on the parkways and highways and byways that take us where we need to go. All seven and a half million human beings who live here, we love this, our Long Island home. Ancient glaciers scraped up these Long Island hills and dragged out the beaches, dug out the coves, bays and harbors, filled all the estuaries, channels, ponds, lakes and streams with water, ground up the soil for the grasslands and barrens and meadows and fields and forests, plowed up a home for the blue stem and hair grass for the heath and heather, the blueberry and bearberry for the pitch pines and the tupelo and the hickory trees, homes for the beech plum and the bayberry and boneset, for the black oaks and the red maples that shade our picnics and swing our swings, perch the birds and make safe homes for all our animal relations. We love the gift of the long, melting, slow moving ice. Eh. All the dinghies and sailboats and motorboats and barges and yachts, the ferries that take us to Bridgeport in New London, from Greenport to Shelter Island, and from there back to North Haven, to Fire Island, from Sayville and Bayshore and Patchogue, from Montauk to Block Island and Rhode Island, all the boats that breeze us out into the sparkling water and bring us back safely to shore, all the gulls and terns and herons and ospreys that swoop and squawk in the cloud blue sky and all the beautiful creatures of the sea that live in the sound and the ocean whom we love to see and care for and learn about and the seafood that graces our Long Island tables, fluke and flounder, lobster and bass, weak fish and blackfish, peconic bay scallops and blue point oysters. We love the boats and water and the lives they bear. Long Island's beaches, bluffs and dunes, trails and boardwalks, parks and museums and mansions, the preserves and orchards, ball fields and lighthouses and picnic tables and fishing holes and bridal paths and garden beds and piers and island tours and arboretums and zoos and campgrounds and working grist mills, all these places bring us back to earth all the amazing creatures we spot as we walk and watch plant us again in this sandy island dirt, draw our roots down deep into this long island. We love the places we can go to look and learn and play. Today in Thanksgiving, we remember the first peoples of this land, the native family clans who preceded us here by eons, the Canarsie, Rockaway, Merrick, Marsapig, the Secatog, the Uncachog on the south shore, the Matinecock, Nessequake, Satalcot, and Korchog on the north shore, the Shinnecock, Manhanset, and Montauket way out east. Of all of these, only the Shinnecock and the Uncachog nations have retained any portion of the land they loved long before the Europeans came to make it theirs. They called this Long Island Pawmanock which means land of tribute. We love and name and honor those who cherish this island before us. 
who tended and tendered this land, suffered and survived. From Port Washington to Orient Point, from Beezy, Breezy Point to Montauk, from the high peak of Janes Hill to the pebble beaches of the North Shore and the white sands of the South Shore, from the sky above us to the four aquifers deep beneath our feet that gift us with fresh water, from the Nisiquag River to the Connecticut, from the East River to the Peconic, from New York Harbor to Gardner's Bay, from way back then to right now and beyond. We love this, our island home. Amen and blessed be. Our benediction is adapted from Judy Chicago via the Velveteen Rabbit Haggadah and Reverend Rachel Hayes, a colleague. And then all that has divided us will merge and then compassion will be wedded to power and then softness will come into a world that is harsh and unkind and then all human beings will be gentle, and then all human beings will be strong, and then all will live in harmony with each other and the earth, and then everywhere will be called Eden once again. May it be so, and amen. We always feel moved to say, okay, now we're done. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't seem to end.